The Team Never Quit podcast is sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. At Navy Federal Credit Union, every day is Veterans Day. Learn more at NavyFederal.org slash veterans. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Team Never Quit podcast. We have got a great lineup for you guys today, but we like to kick this thing off every single week with what we call our Patreon question of the day. If you've never heard of us all talking about Patreon, that's kind of our exclusive community for you guys, our listeners, to get extra access to the show, some live streams, some cool swag, all kind of great stuff. The question today is what are your favorite pizza toppings? We already favorite? had that one. Well, we didn't because this was this, this was the episode. Yeah, we had to re-record that. This is a re-record of this. This is the one that we had, we had trouble record. answering this one, didn't we? Yeah, so two of question. us said oh, well, pineapple. Was, was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hawaiian. I tracked it. It's okay. No, I, I like Hawaiian. It's, yes, this because, is the debate. Yeah, this is a debate because is I this like... this because we got Hawaiian in here? The, no. <laughs> no. I like the sweet with the salty savory. savory. Yeah. yeah. If there's something about that. That's Hawaiian. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's sweet I mean, people. And freaking yeah. I, that's what I like. The only thing I don't like about it is typically they use like the canned pineapples and there's like a little bit like just mushy. I think if it was like a fresh diced pineapple, it might be, I don't know, different. I feel like that would be, I don't know. I think that would be kind of cool. That's a pretty good point. I do spicy chicken sausage, pepperoni, bell peppers, onions, black olives, garlic, olive oil. That's what I had today at Mod Pizza. You ate that today? I totally had Mod Pizza today and it was delicious. <laughs> yeah. That sounds the question, good. The question was on point Bam, for today for me. What's your favorite pizza? I'm a hamburger and mushroom. Oh, nice. It's hamburger and mushroom. My favorite. We could also bring in crusts. What kind of crust do you like? He likes the stuffed crust. Yeah, we got to go with that. I don't really eat the bones. She does, I do. Though. I so like... So it was a win-win we got married. Because I would just have a whole, whole box full of bones. and she's... But I prefer not stuffed crust. I just like regular. Yeah, but so... I'll eat whatever. I typically don't even eat the pizza. I just eat his crust. Yeah. <laughs> so... See, so that's a sacrifice. I made a sacrifice. Such I don't sacrifice. get the stuffed crust anymore. <laughs> I think she write that down. Mike, Ray, how about you guys? Well, you know, I think I said that I'm not into the pineapple pizza so much. Mm -hmm. I just like the pineapple, but I, I'm actually pretty traditional. I like the, just pepperoni, yeah. pepperoni and cheese. You know what I'm saying? You can't ever go yeah. wrong with that. You, you can't. You know. Well, I'm sorry to uh, engage in cultural uh, appropriation, but uh, I actually <laughs> do like the friends. Hawaiian pizza. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm with you. The sweet with the savory. Yeah. Something about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So there it is. The the final debate. The final debate. Yeah. That's what, like, at least two to th three of us with the pineapple. So I'd say that uh, pineapple wins this debate. Thanks Hunter, for the Patreon question. You, Hunter, yeah. I usually like to go nice little pepperoni with some bacon bits on there. Oh. Mm. A little crunch. Oh, yeah. so we're getting, if you want to get like deluxe style. <laughs> Make sure there's pizza in here next time we're done. You got me hungry. There you go. All right, let's go, man. I'm freaking hungry now. Canadian bacon or regular bacon? Gotta be regular. Yeah, regular bacon, regular country bacon. Yeah, it's crispy. Yeah, that's the way to go. That's definitely the way to go. Thanks for the Patreon question, guys. Make sure you check that out. Patreon.com slash Team Never Quit. You can join that conversation. You can hop out on the live streams with us. You can get access to some cool stuff like the challenge coin. We actually have an exclusive hat that you can only, only, only get there at the Patreon membership. You can't get it. You can't buy it anywhere else. That's pretty cool. Make sure y'all check that out. We've got a different format a little bit today. We got two guests on the show. Mike Sorelli is a retired Navy SEAL, former recon Marine and scout sniper. He is also the founder and CEO of Talent War Group. Ray Baviera enlisted in the U.S. Navy in 1992 and retired in 2018. Ray attended and graduated from BUDS in 2004. And during his time in the Navy, he has traveled around the world, lived in Italy, served on multiple combat deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan. But both Mike and Ray are on today to talk to us about Michael Monsoor, a United States Navy SEAL who was killed during Operation Iraqi Freedom and awarded the Medal of Honor. Ray and Mike, thanks for being on today. Yeah, you still look the same age as you did when we came. You know what I'm talking about? I feel like we were talking about that earlier. It's not really fair. After everything that we've been through, you just don't age. <laughs> he, I tell you what, I tell you what, though. Hair, I, hair back I, I, but that's cool. Too. I'm yeah. grayed out. You pull that off. What's that? Yeah, I'm grayed out. You know what I'm saying? I'm grayed out. All right, well, yeah. that's, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. I started pulling that down myself. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, I got a couple of nicknames going. I mean, one was uh, when I was in Afghanistan. So this is a funny story is that um, we're doing a, a rip with the uh, ODA 
and one of the sergeants happened to be a female she uh, she goes wow you got a lot of gray hair and one of the team guys yeah we call him the silverback she goes oh yeah more like the silver fox mm -hmm. and that stuck i could not get rid of that name you're like a hawaiian but, like, get out of here you're yeah. gonna take a name from someone who's not even a team guy yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's how it works <laughs> yeah i know oh my gosh so, so you're the silver fox yeah, I mean, yeah, there's other names, of course, but we'll just leave it. You at know, that. His, his shoulders I popped like up, and yeah, he's like, "You like, guys yeah, are like, like a lot of guys go around trying <laughs> to die that out of there, man. Yeah, boat out. Yeah. We gotta keep it. Some people, you know, a lot of guys are trying to die that stuff out of there. Hell no, man. We gotta own that. Yeah. All right. So let's, right here, yeah. before we get started, then on the book with Mike and everything like that, let's give everybody uh, inside of where where y'all from, how you got into the teams, kind of real fast, mm -hmm. and. um and then we'll get into Mikey's story. Cool? Yeah. So where are you from? Uh, born and raised in the uh, the Bay Area. But uh, I like to say I'm a uh, born again Texan, uh, now living in Austin. Uh, so when people ask where I was born. That's I our say, Bay Area. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I say Frisco, Texas is where I was born. Uh, let them put two and two together. But uh, no, I enlisted in the Marine Corps. I would met a Force Recon Marine. The dude like absolutely impressed the hell out of me. And at my whopping 140 pounds, I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to do what you do. And uh, he helped me enlist. And I became a recon Marine and Scott Sniper. Uh, but we were not part of SOCOM. And when the, I remember war, that. when the war broke out. I remember that when they changed that. I remember when all yeah. that went down. Well, you know, when the war uh, broken, or broke out, you guys were at the forefront. And like, you know, I came into this to do a job. And if that's what I got to right, do. That's right, because they left y'all out. Yeah. That Marine coming out, he's like, all Marines are special forces. And they were like, mm -hmm. Could right, not be more wrong. Watch this. It, I remember when y'all couldn't come play with us. General Al Gray. And I've talked about that where he, I, in my opinion. That's a true story, right? Yeah. I remember, okay. Wildly wrong. I was young when that happened, but I remember it. Wildly wrong. Uh, yes, Marines have a sense of pride, but uh, not all Marines are equal, just as not all SEALs are equal. There's, there's performance comes into play. Um, but then, you know, made it into the SEALs as an officer because the Marine Corps had sent me back to uh to school to become a marine officer where'd you go do that at uh texana good for you and yeah you did that at so, a yeah wow. san diego what, straight wait, to wait, college wait, wait, station. Wait, when did you graduate oh. at a and so i went to school as a sergeant active duty for the marine corps 2000 to 2003. so we're going to some football games or what well yeah <laughs> we're, we're winning at the time no, no, I mean, like right like now. Let's right go. Now, I didn't know you were an Aggie. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I never, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed you saying that. I thought, yeah. that's, I'm, that's I'm awesome, a, bro. <laughs> I'm a, a conflicted house. There's a bunch of Aggies <laughs> running around here, too. So you're safe. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, after that, uh, served at SEAL Team 3 for a number of deployments, went back to Buds as the junior officer training course director. Uh, Did you play a, ball at AM? No. No, 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 man. I was, I was an active duty Marine. So oh, I was working on ROTC. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. And then, uh, yeah, made it to uh, to Damn Neck and then uh, eventually retired. That's a good career. That was That's fun. real good, man. So did you yeah. happen to work under, um, or was Joe Weber, General Joe Weber there at A&M during that time? I believe he was. I believe he, he was. He was a Marine. I met him right after that. That was in charge of when you the Corps Cadets. A, yeah, yeah, the Corps yeah. Cadets at A&M. So technically I was not part of the Corps oh, since gotcha. I was an active duty Sorry. Marine. Yeah. So I instructed, they had something called the Recon Company. Uh -huh. yeah. So I served as the uh, the, the advisor to that. They them. got a great, uh, great programs there like that. Yeah, they do. They do. And it, you know, great a lot school. of those kids don't go into the military, but it provides a lot of discipline and prepares them it, for. Exactly. That's like training in martial arts. You yeah. don't have to do it. You don't have to go into that school house your whole life. I mean, you can take some breaks with it. People yeah. don't, they don't realize that. That's the same way with school or anything else. Mm -hmm. But those kids who go into those programs and come out like an Eagle Scout and all those things that are around to keep guys, especially guys like us, in line. I will say this is cool. The president of the university was Robert Gates. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. That's right. That's cool. A&M's a great school. <laughs> it is. It is a great school. Can I, can I tell a story really quick? Yeah. About, Please, yes. Yeah, so one of the, the funniest things I remember about Ray beyond the, the Battle of Ramadi was, uh, I remember there was an award ceremony. I can't remember how, how long after the deployment, but Ray got four Navy comms oh, with no. V's. No, like just wearing four Navy comms with V's, which first of all, didn't make sense to us. We're like, yeah, no, I bet that looked great. A couple though. of those are bronze stars. <laughs> why wouldn't they? But it, we were calling him Chesty Puller for a little yeah, while. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have the most? We, I don't know. We had a, we, okay, so you know, yeah. we got to figure that out, right? Yeah. I asked somebody a similar question. I was like, so how many 
who has the most of that? And because that's something you would never think about guys doing. Yeah. Like it's actually that's the stupid competitions we do. Who has the so most you, medals? Who can get? And well, and it's a certain one too. There's certain types when you hear guys saying like, "All right, how'd you get that?" Yeah. <laughs> There's always a story behind it. Always, story. always. Yeah, That's the know. best part about being things, man. All yeah. right, your turn. Oh, where I come from. Actually, you know, I grew up in Hawaii. I wasn't born there, like I mentioned earlier. I was born in the Philippines. But um, my mom was American, came back uh, to the States, landed in Hawaii, and she remained there. So I pretty much grew up all my, uh, until I was 18, you know, my life. And uh, then I joined the military. I was, I, I had no direction. I was, I was, I'm not even supposed to be in this seat right now, right? <laughs> so, um only reason I joined the military is because I, I made a promise with my brother to join the military. I was going to say, how did so, that even come up? Yeah. Well, so, you know, I had, you know. Island boy to join the Navy. Yeah. Did, I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, that's a big you thing. You know, my, my track wasn't the military. It, it was probably prison, right? So my brother saw the troubles that I was getting in. We talked about it earlier, fighting, right? Yeah, yeah. Just fighting any chance you got. and um, that's, not, that's not, that's what they do. That's a thing. Uh, that's serious business. That's what you do. That's what wines do. They can scrap, man. You run across one, he tells you wine. Just remember, I told you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, There's not much to do out there besides surf and fight. That's that's I'm true. sitting next to cauliflower ears right here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. all of them. <laughs> yep. well, anyway, so um, they'll whip your ass on a surfboard out in the yeah. middle of his own. I'm not. Even I tell you what, it happen, that's the craziest thing. I tell you what, you will fight for a wave. It's unbelievable. And get back on the shore. That's not messing. Not a made up out. story. That's not exaggerated or anything. Yeah. Hawaiians, they hold that true. Yeah. All right, yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. No, and then all of a sudden, one day, my brother, you know, he calls. We're living separate at this at that point, so he calls me one day. And he goes, "Hey, I want to, I want to link up with you." I'm like, "Where you been?" You know, I'm like, I had no idea where he had gone after he had graduated from high school. So I catch the bus to meet him. See this guy walking sort of straight up. <laughs> I'm like, who's this guy? He's recognizable to me. I know who he is, but he's not the same. You know. So uh, he says, "Yeah, I joined the Navy." I'm like, "Why would you do that?" Yeah, right. <laughs> oh my and God. Like, Navy means never again volunteer heck? yourself. Why in the hell right. you I'm like, why would you go in the military? You know, in Hawaii, we don't like the military in Hawaii. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. not local. So I have a little thing there. So, um, you know, he sort of convinced me, hey, you know, you should join the military, get out of this thing. You're always getting in trouble. You're going to go to jail, et cetera. So I actually said, okay, I'll do it. So I signed this like, paper set. I promised to join the Navy, held it up. He took the photo, right? and his little disposable camera. So uh, I was just talking to my wife about this a few days ago. I said, you know, remember when we found that photo of me holding up the okay, sign? Oh, you still have it? I do. Oh, good. Wow. She, she goes, yeah, remember, remember what it says on it? She goes, there's nothing on it. You really? can't even read what's on it. I said, wow, I could have just not followed through with my my obligation <laughs> of joining the military, but I did. Wait, you know are you sure? Right, yeah, you know like a saying? crappy disposable camera flash. Yeah, it's so actually a photo of me holding it up. I was like, wow, I can't believe I still Isn't have that, that photo. Isn't that the perfect uh, example of Zen, right? No. Clear, clear. It's like, hey, man. You, you know, the thing here that I, I'm tired of the, the preconceived notions of the military and who we are. Here's a perfect example of a guy who was on, on the path to getting major trouble as a kid, enlisted in the Navy, served honorably, valorious awards for, for days, uh, retired as a, a chief yeah, chief, yeah, yeah. and is now a doctor, as a doctorate in education. <laughs> in the SEAL teams. Yeah, no, I, think about that. <laughs> oh my I gosh. mean, when you say you shouldn't be sitting in that chair, those are the ones who do. Yeah. And it, it, those the throwaways are the ones you want. I don't know, whatever it is, people always ask me, I'm saying, What's, what makes you guys? Why why y'all? I'm like, man, I don't know. That's a God thing. But if you take one kid from each walk of life, and they're usually there's a, they're 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 on the edge, like there is an edge. There's a line between good and bad, right? Well, there's got to be somebody holding that that sticks in that spot, and most of us lean all the way over to the side. We can't even help it. But when you throw us around guys like us, then it's like, well, man, you know, we'll do good, bad, and different. Just tell us to do something. Yeah. And yeah. look at you now. Hey, you know what? Being a SEAL was pretty much the same thing I was doing as a kid. That's my point. I say that you know, too. Like, man, you don't understand. <laughs> if you got if you got to have a temper on you, you want to get out and get into some mischief, man, go be a team guy. So is yeah. your brother <laughs> is he just over the moon proud of you? Uh well, when I was in so I went to Buzz, like I said, three times. I went to uh when I was in the Buzz the second time, my brother had committed suicide. Oh so my gosh. but he was proud of me in the sense that I attempted it. Right. He well, didn't know I was going to, well, he actually did know I was going the second time. I fully believe in yeah. spirits and that yeah. spirits stay with us. And I can guarantee you he's very proud of you. Yeah. That's so. really awesome. I mean, he wanted to go. He just didn't have the eyes. Yeah. The vision. 
Wow. So because you know they didn't have like PRK and LASIK yeah. like they have now. You know what I'm saying? So it's still hard when we went in. Yeah. I remember that. Oh my god. I definitely remember that. All right. You want to talk about Mikey for a little bit? Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Well, yeah. While we're here, so we'll, we'll get into this. Um, let's start off by just saying we, we were Ramadi. We were on the team. We were in different SEAL teams together. Y'all SEAL team three. I was in SEAL team five. All right. And then in oh oh five oh six, right? Is that when y'all were there? Yeah, that's right. So I was getting my ass handed me in Afghanistan. Oh five. Went to the hospital. When I got out of the hospital. They were already over in the war in Ramadi, which was the last stand of every freaking piece of shit you could imagine. I mean. This it was war torn. The story's coming out. Everyone was getting killed or blown up. I mean, it it was awesome for a team guy. It was where you would expect to find us. All right, here we go. I think first off, let me say this: uh, I'm filling in for uh, Rose Ray, who wrote the book "Defend Us in Battle" alongside George Monsoor. Uh, she is uh, a, a SEAL spouse, and we all know spouses yeah, of SEAL served. Um, we're covering down. That's yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. So. Um, you know, this was actually my second time in Ramadi. I was there in 2005. Uh, I fired my weapon uh, for the first time. I'm like, yeah, I'm a vet combat veteran yeah. now. Of course, I, I remember it. doing that too. I, I, I fired it. In, in nothing. I swear, I swear, I did yeah. that too, man. I'm there was a base attack, and I just fired that direction. Uh, so uh, we That's went back. Man. I've never heard anybody say that out loud. It was it's but the I truth. That. Like, I, as a team guy, especially. But yeah, baptism I of that. fire. <laughs> yeah. I'm, a, I'm a man. So uh, we go back, and, and you know, we were actually supposed to deploy to Baghdad, um, and it got switched last minute, and Jocko had uh, somehow, you know, faltered. Yeah, we'll gladly take Ramadi. He, he was aware of what was going on there. And that there was a major push for a battle coming up. Um, but you don't really know what you're walking into. No. Uh, you know, wily eyed and na naive and and you're just you, you want to prove yourself. And uh we I think the realization of what we stepped into uh set pretty pretty quickly, especially when Cowie was the first uh and you guys know Cowie uh Merrill uh was the first wounded and Ray was there. No, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. there at that day. Um but when we heard of it. So yeah, you know, because when we were at Shark Base, some we actually went to Corregidor. That's right. To go check yeah. that part out, that that place out also. So we did our first operation. I remember that. Right. It yeah. was like, uh, and I, I remember the captain of the was it the first of the five hundred six five hundred six. He's like, yeah, we're gonna you guys we're gonna get contacted within thirty minutes. We're like, yeah, yeah, we'll see, right? And like, no kidding, we got thir contact within thirty minutes. You know, so we're like, wow, this place is nuts. You know, and got crazy. We're all on the roof. I don't know if you remember that day. We're on the roof shooting at that car, <laughs> shooting at some insurgents behind the car. I remember when that's, but, that stuff started coming across the wire about y'all. Because I was still busted up. I, I That's how I, I just lay around yeah. and doing the physical therapy, reading that stuff. And the guys were talking about it. Y'all were all abuzz. Because it was every day. I mean, every day y'all were getting into it. And when we talk about Ramadi and Corregidor and stuff like that, those are names of little camps and towns inside of Iraq. Mm -hmm. All right, so we basically move into a city. Like they have their own police force and everything like that. Imagine another detachment that they've assigned to that police force in there to help secure that city. That's what we are. I I'm curious because I'm the outsider of the military. I don't understand. I wasn't married to Marcus when he was. Yeah, hey, I don't. I don't understand um, the military. Either <laughs> so when you're in Ramadi, I've seen pictures of where Marcus was when he was there. Are you actually on a base, or are you like posting up in? houses or whatever it's like an outstation right they like an outstation out there they put some walls up maybe some yeah. chain link fence all right so you'll run one unit <laughs> okay. and they'll be in a palace like we stayed in yeah. saddam's palace in baghdad mm -hmm. one of them mm -hmm. that was our base we secured so that. that's where you slept that's where we slept there were dudes sleeping in saddam's bedroom oh my god <laughs> and then in his pool house yeah. and then there's when we go on a mission if we go out into town we'll take a house to to, to set the conditions for you uh Al Qaeda had declared Ramadi their caliphate, okay. which means their capital. And quite frankly, they owned like 90% of it. Oh, yeah. wow. And so you'd look at the map and we, we paint red is enemy held territory and then blue is, is friendly us. And so you'd have these blue specks yeah, in all red. Imagine one of those AT&T Verizon maps, right? Yeah, like a little go. spot, that was us. 
But so you're actually, are you staying in like an outpost, you know, plywood camp or are you actually staying in a taken over house in, when you were in Ramadi? So Shark Base was one of Saddam's vacation palaces. So yeah. that was wow. a pretty, pretty defined structure. And then we had tents in there. Yeah. yeah. And we, we would section off the rooms to allow four guys to sleep. Where we were in was a place called Full Metal Jacket because the building looked like something out of Full Metal Jacket, which wow. is the Vietnam yeah. movie. And it was, it was austere living. But it was also you with the boys. Yeah. It, yeah, it yeah. is some of the fondest <laughs> memories I oh, have. Oh, the greatest. Yeah. The, the yeah. shenanigans. The games. Oh, you can't believe yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> can't bring, but we can have a good yeah, time it anywhere. All, it was a good time. Yeah. And when you're in there, just to paint the picture for the people that haven't served and don't understand all that, are you, is it like 12 of y'all? Is it a whole bunch? How many of y'all are oh, in whole, this area? I think we were short a few people in Delta Platoon. Um, three guys, I think. Not, I can't remember. So that's where we had. A couple guys come with us but anyway um our whole platoon wasn't in one area i mean this full metal jacket was a two-story building okay. like oh yeah they it wasn't up. even like fully built it seemed like right it was no, like it had been bombed out there yeah, yeah it wasn't yeah. completed bombed out a little bit yeah so there's some of us here upstairs some of us downstairs you know um, yeah, that's where we most died. of most of the platoon is downstairs okay. the core of the platoon and, and remind me you can only sh you had a certain day you could shower or days yeah i mean yeah as a matter of fact, we we go go and take bottled water showers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? If you can get a bottle of water, take you know, the shower. Guys, if you don't want to shoot out even further than that, like our recon guys, <laughs> we have to burn your own crap. Oh, and they yeah. would just be. You can see it on their face when someone's miserable. <laughs> see, it's lots of sand fleas. So oh, that's God. Oh, oh, my God. Yeah. the yeah. stage of like oh. where you're staying. So yeah. that's that's your living condition. But when you, you're you tried there. to stay there as little as possible. We tried to like. So, so the, the army, regardless of our op tempo, and there's only 18 of you in a platoon, they are running multiple patrols a day. Mm -hmm. And so our job that, in that these guys came in on the back end and continued was the, the we're so used to as SEALs being the main element, meaning we're the main effort and everyone else supports us. Well, for this battle in particular, the, the role swapped. It's different. And we, we said, hey, you know, the main element is the young infantry soldiers that's moving from house to house. Let's take a position above them where we have height of eyes and line of sight and basically supported them with sniper overwatch. And that was the primary mission run. And it was a deviation from what we're used to as SEALs because we were used to direct action raids right. in in Iraq. That right. explains so much. I've no, I don't know why I've never asked you those questions, but for, and for a lot of people that like me that don't really have this inside knowledge on that, we don't understand where, you know, like, let's just say Operation Red Wing, where right? four guys are on a mountain looking over to just get some intel on someone. And then in the next country over, y'all are in a city. Like, what are you doing? What's the purpose? So that actually explains yeah, a lot. That, when you said that, we were in the Overwatch. So we go take a building down, a house, a, a school or something, go all the way and split up in the floors. And then the Marines or the infantry would come in. And this is where I learned to appreciate Marines. I'll never forget it. These two young 18, 19-year-old kids came in. They look like juggernauts. Their helmet and their and their body armor and all their kit was so thick and big mm -hmm. you couldn't see their just barely their face and they had those razor glasses on rifle dragging the ground it was so long <laughs> and these I watched these two these two dudes go I mean house to house kicking the door and rolling out and this thing would blow up and these two little bastards would come out dust flying didn't care. <laughs> It was like they were having the best time. I'll never, I, I never got their so name. Like, Dude, job is to protect watch them. them. We protected them. Yeah, yes. on this one because they're they're <laughs> they're doing the work to let's let's just say win the city back. Right. Yeah. That, my friends, is the sweet sound of another Shopify sale. It is music to my ears. If you don't know what that sound effect is, it is the glorious sound that Shopify plays whenever you get a new order on your Shopify e-commerce website. And if you've never heard of Shopify, they are the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. They are the platform trusted by millions of entrepreneurs to create their online store and so much more. Team Never Quit's been using Shopify for nearly a decade. I realized the other day that I've been with Team Never Quit 
quit since I think around 2013 is when I actually started working behind the scenes uh, to create the original logo and the original brand. And when we first started selling the Navy SEAL Creed t-shirt, we used Shopify to launch everything. And if you guys have been an OG, you've probably known that. Shopify makes it simple to sell to anyone from anywhere, whether you're selling t-shirts like us or you're selling books or you're selling digital downloads like an ebook or a course, you can do it all with Shopify. And with Shopify, you'll customize your online store to your brand. You'll be able to discover new customers and build the relationships that are going to keep them coming back and they will help you cover all the sales channels. You're going to successfully grow your business from an in-person point of sale system like we use at Patriot Tour to an all-in-one e-commerce platform, even across social media platforms like TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. You know the customers are hanging out there. You know that you're able to get your site out there. That's going to be super helpful. And thanks to their 24-7 support and free on-demand business courses, Shopify will be there to help you succeed every step of the way. It's how every minute new sellers around the world make their first sale with Shopify, and you guys can too. You guys might not know this, but 10 years ago when Melanie and Marcus reached out to me to create the first t-shirt, that was how we all got started. We started with a t-shirt design with a Navy SEAL creed on the back, and that's morphed into this podcast. And it's just been an incredible journey. And Shopify made it super easy for us to get that first sale. It didn't require a lot of technical expertise. I mean, I remember at the time I had never built a website. I was just starting to build websites back then. So when you're ready to take your idea to the world, do it with Shopify, the e-commerce platform powering millions of businesses down the street and around the globe. And now it's your turn to try Shopify for free and start selling anywhere. This is Possibility Powered by Shopify. Sign up for a free trial at shopify.com slash TNQ. That is all lowercase, shopify.com slash TNQ to start selling online today. Shopify.com slash TNQ. where we did accept risk is sometimes we would move into those territories ahead of them. Mm. And then most of the times we'd wait for them to leave before we pulled out. Yeah. Okay. So we did accept risk uh, in those instances uh, to support those guys and it was well worth it, man. So you're mostly rooftop overwatch. Yeah, but yeah, I still have to move through the streets yeah. to get okay. there. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, Sorry, so everything that we that go stage. through our training for, like our, you know, special operations. Yeah, so whatever they would do, we do the first like time, that, yeah. go and take the house down and set up, and then they come and do yeah. what we did kind of mm -hmm. through there. And what mm -hmm. we, what, what yeah, something. we're still clearing rooms. Yeah. I mean, to make sure that building is what we want. If it was you know cold, so. guys would be like, hey, man, make sure there's people in there. Yeah. <laughs> Before yeah. you Make sure it's for mattresses. In there no, I mean, man, you know, I'm not kidding. It gets cold over there. I yeah. will say this. We were... You know, you go through hard training and you're finally, it's like Friday night lights. Mm -hmm. You finally are in the game. Mm -hmm. I know for you, you'd already seen uh, combat, but, but for us, it was like the first major combat we, we'd ever seen. And you don't want to go home and you don't want to be sitting on that base either. You, you wanted to be outside the, uh, the wire. And there is also, a, a, again, a naivety that, you know, it'll, it'll never happen to us. We'll never get hit. We'll never get wounded. Yeah. And uh, when you start seeing guys like Cowie, hit and then uh mark lee and yeah and, i think i think mark lee is the one that for, at least for really me shook that really shook me mm -hmm. i mean yeah we we're getting after it every day how we got hit is under unfortunate um i mean our days were like we go out and there's bullets just riddling off the wall you know they're just like wow i'm surprised i didn't get hit <laughs> but you know you're you're also fortunate that you're there yeah and because we we there were so many more deserving team guys that yeah, should have been absolutely. there than, than uh, me i'm not gonna say you no, me but too, like, man. We had guys sitting Regular in the Philippines dude, that like, oh, don't even get me started on that. Yeah, that, is like, that what you said? Yeah, don't, JJ, don't even get me talking about Damien, that, man. I'm freaking yeah, Maddie. Some, some I mean, guys, guys who oh, yeah, just yeah. would have been more effective than than I know personally, man. I don't know why that happens like that. Why they why that why that does? Because you you some guys will run in that you know are operators. I'm just yeah. like, dude, maybe it was good you weren't there because yeah. the way we were doing things. Well, some guys fire guys up so bad and you can't pull them back. Fearless. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. And you talking about getting into something every day. He, he's not kidding, man. That was R Ramani. It was it was on. It's like a football player saying he's he don't he want to get hit when he goes in, or, or he's never had that really happen in the game. Soon as you went out there, they're waiting on our ass. Mm -hmm. That's okay. right. Sorry, I just wanted to set that stage for the listeners and yes, people to really just understand like where y'all were, what your atmosphere is like. You know, you're not just leaving a base and just going to set up somewhere. You're staying in this area in the city. Also moving house to house, but that's that's what you're doing. That's part of this. Yeah, mission. I think uh, even like Time Magazine had like Ramadi at the time as the most deadliest place, like the most deadliest city, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it did at that, like that time. But it's funny at that, that time. At that, that time, yeah. 
So at that time, yeah. and that place to honest to me looked like that's true, man. When the Fallujah there. boys talk, you shut up. When them guys open their mouths, the Fallujah boys, there's a couple of them out there, man. Ramadi boys are one of them guys. Are th these right here, mm -hmm. not necessarily. I'm not us, but we came in just. Fi I just finished up what they started. Yeah. Because by the time we left out, they were running races like marathons, oh, and there yeah. was charity events. I oh, mean, yeah, they. That's right. That's right. Remember that? Yeah, I heard about that. So yeah. that was not the case when they they went in first. We were doing marathons already. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> and sprints, and we're in, yeah. Ramadi miles. Ramadi miles. Ramadi miles. Yeah. Oh my God. Call those tanks. I, I remember yeah. hearing that. I was like, what's a Ramadi yeah. mile? Like, don't worry, you'll figure it out. And that means you got to call a tank in to bust your way back out of there, and they'll make, they won't pick you up. You can't get on the making run behind them. I don't know if you remember, we did a, a run across the, uh, while being mortared, the field, the big, uh, somebody was puking. Yeah. But yeah. we were, it was, a, it was a tough run across that field. I ain't gonna lie. I was like, man. Loaded down with all your gear, just across this uh, in the heat. In the heat, you know, like. So, if you ever taken titles and descriptions out, like Navy and SEAL, take all that out of there. We're just some kids from different places and met up, and we got signed up to go overseas to fight over there. When they say Babylon, like first, right? The, we don't ever talk about that kind of stuff. The mischief in the op. Yeah. Like stuck in the mud. You remember that first time you jump on that moon dust, gets wet, and you just kind of stuck <laughs> yeah. up to here, and yeah. the Humvees. And people are like, you guys do such a great job. It's like, you can't believe what goes into getting that done. Or somebody cracks a joke oh. in a firefight and everyone laughs. Well, that's the best. And it's like <laughs> yeah, a, it's like a awesome. reset almost. Like, hey, yeah. we all good? Yeah, we're good. Yeah. It's like so, a clicker, like a whistle. Yeah. yeah. Exactly it's right. Somebody does that and every, every one of us will be like, oh. So was Ramadi like at that time, and I probably sound really stupid asking this, but was it just a ghost town or were there actually, was it populated with civilians? So unlike... Fallujah in uh was it Fallujah was 0405 oh, yeah. uh they gave the citizens like a few weeks to clear the city they told them we're going to clear through you whoever's left behind is going to be considered al-Qaeda Ramadi was the capital capital of Al Anbar province it was I want to say three or four times the size of Fallujah so they couldn't do that oh, wow. because it would have created this massive refugee problem so it made the problem even worse that hey you're going to go clear the city and win it back with good people just Innocent to, uh, Iraqis still in place. So that's what made it a little more difficult. And we were a lot more concerned about uh, collateral damage or, or civilian casualties. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Trying to get on the day-to-day -day life because remember the bad guys know that. So do you have to technically protect the civilians too? Yes. Or you, you're just protecting our They'll do it automatically. Guys. Both. Both. They'll, okay. they'll do it automatically because they'll try and pull us into a civilian populace. But are the, are the Al-Qaeda attacking civilians yes they are yeah okay. that's what we got brought in okay they're the ones creating all so the havoc civilians in the city. want you there at first you know it's like the lesser <laughs> like the lesser yeah. of two evils mm -hmm. they just want they wanted peace, peace and prosperity um but it took a while to win them over and that's actually when the the battle started to turn mm -hmm. is that the the civilian the iraqi civilian said oh wait these guys can actually win they can get rid of these these thugs and they started to work with Americans and uh, the uh, tribal awakening, the Sunni yeah, yeah. awakening. Sunni, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, finally got the Sunni, which Al Anbar is predominantly Sunni, to say, okay, hey, we'll work with you Americans to to rid this uh, this province of uh, of Al Qaeda. Just think about any other country coming here and but living here, and then some guys just walking in here and doing their doing their thing, and trying to make you happy, and then you go out and somebody run an American for whatever reason. Yeah, it's how hard, hard that is. Imagine. Not only yeah. that, you're talking about 18 to 20 what year olds trying to get that done. Yeah, we don't exactly have the best demeanor, mm -hmm. and our attitudes kind of suck. Yeah, you just got discipline on top of that. That's amazing. We get it done at that age. Imagine now. Yeah, like if we went over there right now, how this would go down? I mean, we fight completely different. Mm -hmm. We would fight completely different, and it would be a lot more fun and effective, actually. Yeah, knowing what yeah, we know I now. Agree with that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when I think about that, it pisses me off. I was like, man, if I could just wait, you know, take it, but you, you don't get to pick that. No, hindsight is... Uh, hindsight, yeah. Okay, so that shells daily. Well, sorry, we've interrupted. I wanted to just set the, the um, vision of where y'all were. Yeah, but at this point, Mikey, uh, you know, when Cowie was wounded, uh, Mikey was already uh, nominated for the Silver Star for running into the street to pull him to safety. And, and I think... Transitioning to, to why we're here, um, you know, I met Mikey first in comm school uh, prior to, to the, the main work. I How started. are you getting all these, these badass schools uh, as a zero? 
You so, understand what I'm saying? Yeah, no, yeah. I got you. Yeah. Okay, so I, I mean, up, you keep throwing this down on me. I'm like, are you, you fully, what's what's going on? So I think these? all officers should go through comm school. I know you do. That's, I know, that's all, you, all officers think one, that. That's not that's your, your number one. You primary. don't get to have that. We're enlisted guys get to have that. Well, so here's the thing. If you ever <laughs> can't see, have it all, sir. If you ever see pictures of me later on, so when I was a troop commander over at uh, uh, the other place, I wore my SATCOM on my, my rig. That was my number one weapon. And, and so I, I, I'm a strong believer in that, but... Yeah, I got JTAC as well. Oh. I came over as a sniper from the Marine Corps. So yeah, uh, <laughs> man, those are the cherry ones right there, and you can't cross the streams of breach. No, no, but I, I do agree with you, Constable. Oh, don't don't put me near explosives. Yeah, like, <laughs> guys, we take like, hey, it, sir, it, we'll, yeah, we'll we'll for you. Uh, so, Mike, you you know, one handsome kid, uh, about six two, two fifteen. Yeah, is that accurate? He's probably a lot lighter than that when we first started, but yeah, he, he put on weight on on deployment. And so he had this California style, Southern California kid, but he came from a good Catholic family. And he had a dry sense of humor and he wasn't the loudest man in the room. He, yeah, again, he had that, humble, that, yeah. that cool California sort of surfer style about him. Um, and it, he, it was hard to get a read on him, but he was just a nice guy. And he would, he would do an off color joke every once in a while. But uh, what I like about him and what I think, you know, the, the warrior nature is like, he just spoke through actions, not words. And that's what I got from Mikey real quick. Um, and then getting to know him through workup. I didn't do the workup with these guys. I was with another task unit and switched over to the last, uh, last month. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'll just to reiterate what he said. I mean, Mike was a, just a really good dude, you know, just, he, he was more of doing stuff rather than saying it, you know what I'm saying? Um, and kind of going back, I actually knew Mike since buds you know, um, in class 250. So from 250 to SQT. Oh, you're right? the whole time? The whole time, all the way to <laughs> SEAL Team 3 Delta Platoon, right? Is there anybody else in else crew? Or just so it was, uh, there was a bunch of guys from my class that went to SEAL Team 3, but in- No, 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 I'm talking about the whole line. Uh, yeah, uh, Tom DeShazo. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, three of us. Three yeah. of us were in Delta Platoon together. Was that y'all's yeah. first push? It was our first push, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we weren't, we didn't know where we were going to go. We right. were like, hey, we're here. When did you y'all guys. find out you were going into Ramadi? I know that, you know, say at the time we didn't know how it all worked, right? It was like sort of this competition to see who's the best task unit, right? Yeah. And <laughs> the, the best task unit gets selected to go somewhere, right? So uh, I remember Jocko saying, hey, you know, you got, we, you know, we, uh, we kick ass in what we're doing, you know, we put out this, that, and the other, you know what I'm saying? We have a chance. We have a chance at this. So, you know, there's a lot of focus on that. And a lot of us, you guys are like, yeah, let's, and, and by the way, we have a sister platoon, right? Charlie platoon, we have Biggles, you know, Ryan Job. we have, uh, we have uh, Kevin. Chris was in your platoon. Uh, Chris. Kyle? He was a sister Charlie. platoon. He was a Charlie. Yeah. Tony and Friday. Yeah. That's right, Tony. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all had a great lineup. I we mean, had some it, pretty solid guys. Oh, you know? but say those names from Jocko on down. You can still say Jocko's name and even civilians know he is. Yeah. yeah. That is true. I mean, I mean look at, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, I those guys right. that y'all ran with in Ramadi yeah. are, are straight up badasses and some of them are dead and their reputation is just, you know, other ones are in a museum. They're not even dead yet. Mm -hmm. This is, these are the, the guys we're talking about right now are the ones who ran with all of the, those, those people that you read about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I was in a different task unit in, in task unit, uh, Bruiser definitely uh, stood out. But we, when you say like the best task unit, you know, for those listening, it's like choosing between three units that are still going to go do great work. Absolutely. Regardless. Absolutely. Um, so it just, yeah, it's highly competitive in the SEAL teams in a good way. Uh, but it does stop at a point where, you know, you compete, there's a winner, and then that winner stops and explains what they did differently so that everyone else can learn. Because at the end of the day, you know, if he's better than me with a pistol or clearing a room, he's going to give me that that transfer of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So we could, I eventually have his back. Oh, sure. Room. Yeah. Hell, oh, not only by watching, but we just do that. Yeah. I mean, like graciously. So much so, it's like people think, if they're not paying attention, they think we're yelling at each other. But when we try and give that knowledge over, you know it because we say it in a certain way where it hits, it's like a hammering that some bitch home. Yeah. For sure. Yep. And that competition is, it's something with us. It's, it's, it's definitely what dry, so drives. So he was the in thing. Delta with you, and y'all get the what month year is this that y'all go to? Two thousand six. So it's about I think uh, SEAL Team Three made the final decision because again I think it was supposed to be an East Coast platoon that was in Ramadi, 
but whenever there was a realignment, I think uh, T. U. Bruiser and everyone else found out probably around February or January of 2006 that you guys would be going to Ramadi because I was still in Tasking to Charlotte. Yeah, it, it, about that time frame, yeah. and so we started, you know, really starting to prepare ourselves mentally for that. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, there was always that possibility. I mean, you're going to a war zone. You know what I'm saying? You're going to get, you know, you, you, you're going to get into gun battles and you're just going to be fighting. So, so it's something that we had to prepare. And it, as a matter of fact, I think that uh, our workup really prepared us well for that. Because, you know, when we first got in our first tick, which is really on shark base, I would say. You're the night that the we, night we yeah. were shooting. I don't know if that's our first take, but yeah, it was. But yeah, uh, yeah so there was some uh, across take the, so, tro troops in contact. Yeah, troops in contact. So you know where Shark Base is at. The Euphrates River is right there. Right there. Right there. Like right on. Right, the like bank. right there. Yeah. So <laughs> um, I guess there was some gunfire coming across right at our building. Oh, from the yeah. Marine, the Hurricane Point Marine. Yeah. Thing the over there. So they were they yeah. were in between. In between. Oh, yeah, nice. I think three or four shooters, and uh, I think it was. Probably a uh, unproportional response. <laughs> Wait a minute. This one y'all went up the wall? We heard about this. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it was an unproportional uh, response oh, yeah. because that was the first time that even some of the two or three platooners yeah, yeah, had yeah. fired their weapon. Yeah. We we're all on the roof. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember I, I, I literally about that. sat with my, my gun up just watching everyone shoot because I like there was there was no room to to squeeze, squeeze in. in there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you look right over the wall and there's the Euphrates River. Yeah. One's been here since the beginning. Yeah. And then right on the other side of the land, there's two bases. Oh, it kind of, the, it splits. We're literally talking about the biblical map. Yeah. 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 It's so crazy. Cradle of life. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Sorry. Keep going. Please no, keep no. Going. So that's, uh, so that was pretty exciting. And at that point, I, I thought I was, I'm like, okay, this is not as bad. You know what I'm saying? I've sat behind um, the butts at a shooting range and you hear snaps. I'm like, okay, yeah, that that's a snap. You know what I'm saying? So. Um, but when you go fighting on the streets, a little bit different. Yeah, There's a lot of different than you know being on a roof and engaging at a target versus you're on a, on the street now in an alleyway and there's rounds coming towards you. I'm like, okay, you know, how do you respond to that? You know what I'm saying? So, a lot. Of, I, I thought a lot of us were you know calm under pressure. You know, keeping our heads um, uh, on us at that time. So. I, when we were and, sitting in there, who, who was first? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, and that, you know, that really go translate. I want to really bring it back to Mikey, but that really shows how Mikey operated too, because he took point. At, he actually transferred to point. That's right. As point man. But we can go ahead. With the machine gun. Yeah, with the machine gun. In the street. So he, he would patrol next to a point man. Yeah. Who uh, I believe was JP Dinell. Yeah. Who had a sniper rifle. Um, and so it was, you know, sort of a, a buddy pair. Yeah. Like that if they point, were to yeah. take contact, Mikey had overwhelming uh, fire superiority. JP could focus on navigating to the position we would and ultimately take. And this is take. Mikey's first time in combat as well. This was a, almost everyone's so yeah. first time, everyone except for Delta. a select few. Okay. And Charlie, just and a select Charlie. few. Wow. Yeah. Guys and had you got done Jocko raids. whittling behind the wheel. <laughs> Some guys had done you know, direct action raids, yeah, but there yeah, were no yeah. gunfights or anything like that yeah. uh, because they were hitting pretty benign targets in Baghdad on right. the previous deployment. Wow. Uh, they would go out in the daytime. Remember hearing that? Just seals no tour. We go at night yeah. usually. So when you're going out, I mean, they were in that city. It's just these boys are going to, hey, look, we're going to pick a fight, period. You know, let's do this. And they did. So when the, when he was taking point um, in the street, is that when he was nominated for the his first? You were doing award? a street crossing? I believe they were doing a street I'm not crossing. sure if he was taking a point on that because we're still figuring things out, but I, I think they were doing a street crossing somewhere. In, yeah. Which is, is when you're exposed to danger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like somebody holds security and somebody runs across the street, right. set security on his site, and, and it yeah. just leapfrogs until, but uh, regardless of setting security, uh, Cowie was shot through the right femur. I believe so. Uh, yeah, and uh, Cowie eventually had to go home, but he was, he was going to be okay. Okay. Uh, probably the ha most handsome Hawaiian I've ever uh, met, and another Deadly guy too, who without was, a gun. was really good at jujitsu. <laughs> yeah, you very not good. Want to, yeah. Uh, Just a badass, right? One yeah. of the kind of guys. Yeah. yeah, and he got shot. That's yeah. an even cooler stat now. Yeah. yeah, now he's got that on him. And he uh, he served out the remainder of his career, I believe, at uh, at Buds, at Buds, uh, yeah. selecting the next generation of yeah, uh, nice. of seals, but.
Wow, what a year. I cannot believe we are almost at the end of the year already. It has been an eventful few years. That's certainly true with constant reminders of how uncertain life can be. Having quality term life insurance can help you put your mind at ease knowing that your family is taken care of if something unexpected happens. I want to talk to you guys about our podcast sponsors over at Fabric by Gerber Life. They were designed by parents for parents to help you get a high quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. Fabric's new lower prices mean significant savings over other providers with great quality policies like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. Life insurance can have a bad rap for being complicated. I know because I've experienced it myself, but Fabric makes it easy to apply with its seamless digital experience. It's all online. It's on your time. And if you need extra support, Fabric's team of licensed insurance agents can answer questions along the way. It takes less than 10 minutes to apply. See your quote, and then you can personalize your quote to fit your family's needs. You can be offered coverage instantly with no health exam required. Fabric has partnered with Gerber Life, trusted by millions of families like yours for over 50 years. They've got over 1,600 five-star reviews on Trustpilot.com, which means you can feel confident knowing you're going to get a high-quality policy that is perfect for your family. Fabric has a 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can cancel at any time. And Fabric was specifically designed to give parents like you affordable term life insurance plus wills, access to college savings funds, and more tools to help protect your family's financial future, all in an easy online experience. I mean, anything a parent can get to make their life a little easier goes a long way. Protect your family today with Fabric by Gerber Life. Apply today in just 10 minutes at meetfabric.com slash TNQ. That's meetfabric.com slash TNQ. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash TNQ. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Assurance Company, not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting and health question. Uh, you know, we, you know, I look back fondly on those days where you don't know your head from your ass. Um, and with each patrol, each mission, we, we, you know, we got some more lessons learned. We sharpened our, our blade. Uh, but regardless, you know, still very, very young within the combat zone. And regardless of it, you know, we had, and this is what I love most. And from Dr. Ray to, uh, to Mikey and to all the rest of the guys, they did a phenomenal job of creating a relationship from the privates up to the 06s with the Army and the Marine Corps by the way that they conducted themselves. And we all know SEALs can be notorious for, for being assholes. Um, <laughs> so Jocko made, yeah, like true like statement, statement. True. Yeah. made some good calls of like, hey guys, where, where the Army uh, ACUs, which was that sort of blue chip pattern at the time, mm-hmm. uh, you know, shave your heads, uh, shave, your, your, shave your faces. Um, and, and focus on building relationships because na- naturally when you, you step into a, a, a combat zone, there's that inner service rivalry mm-hmm. and the army doesn't necessarily trust you. And maybe we don't trust the army. Yeah. Um, but eventually you get past the, the butt sniffing phase. Right. Uh, even adults do that. Mm-hmm. And you look at the army brings all these capabilities and we bring these capabilities. They're different, but when you mesh them together, it is amazing what we can do as a team. And that was as a second deployment, I was shocked. But I'm like, oh, the army actually from the Marine Corps, they like bred you to hate the army. Uh, fun inter service rivalry. I'm like, these guys are amazing. And the first of the 506 who we were attached with is the the, the famous band of brothers from yeah. the the show, oh, and wow. just as brave as the uh, the World War II days. And that's why, yeah, they, they got the yeah. history. Yeah. They don't yeah. mess around yeah. over there, man. They yeah. know that. Let's, yeah. And but to his point though, like uh, so, Lieutenant Ron Ron Clark was. Lieutenant Colonel. Oh, Lieutenant Colonel. Now, now three-star general. Three, Ron three-star Clark. general. So yeah. check this oh, wow. out. So I, I met, I ran into him about three years ago. I went to an army ball. I was invited to an army ball and he was there. And I, you know, I was- You in, got invited uh, to an army ball? Well, I, I have a friend who was the chaplain. She invited me over. Oh, she yeah, knew yeah, I was in Hawaii. Yeah. yeah. So, um, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I went. Yeah. <laughs> so I got dressed up, right? So. Uh, he, as soon as he walks in, 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 into the ball, he sees me, he's like, oh my gosh. And I was like, we're like long lost buddies. Aww, and they're like, so awesome. this guy's an E7, that guy's a general in our, you know, like what's going <laughs> on here? When the stars come right? around, yeah. But it was, it was, it's just because that, that moment in time, you know, we were able to solidify that solid relationship, that working relationship that, you know, Mike was just mentioning. So, and la- one last thing is, I don't know if you remember, we had the ODA team that came out. Do you remember that? Yeah. So the ODA team is what we would normally look like, right? A ragtag 
skid row bunch of guys, patches all over, long hair, et cetera. That's what they look like. What's yeah. ODA? Uh, uh, the Green Berets, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, Operational okay. Detachment Alpha. Alpha. We actually interviewed yeah. a um, Green Beret the other day. Yeah. It was the first medic that was... Um, that pulled me off the mountain. That, that was got two more miss on the mountain. And he said the funniest thing. I haven't laughed that hard in so long. He said uh, he was talking about the mission and uh, before they actually found Marcus. And he said that some of the um, seals had come down, like they had kind of met up at a part of the mountain. And he goes, yeah. And the seals were, I don't want to play well with others. And <laughs> <laughs> how he said it, I laugh so hard because I'm like, they are like that. Like all of y'all are just like, Especially when someone's got hurt, yeah, like, like a bunch of predators coming down, like get out of the way. We're going to get yeah, a boy. Well, kind and of, it, that's exactly how they yeah, and because and I know, like obviously, because Marcus is a team guy. Like the teams wanted to take care of that. They wanted to handle all of that. So they're thinking, why the fuck is the army coming in and rescuing our guy? Like we need to be doing that. So and then the absolutely. army's like, get in there and let's get this guy before yeah. the team guys are getting it. It was uh-huh. just funny. So it's win win for me. For they were me working to real hear hard. Him <laughs> say that the seals were like, you know. We don't want to play well with others. Uh, well, you know, I was saying, Ramadi, the army pretty much busted us out of every bad situation. Every, we hey, were so happy. They to had see that them. striker battalion yeah. right there, yeah. parked outside the yeah. gate. Yeah. And when, when we would get into a jam, bulldog, on the, he was an Aggie too, Marine, badass tanker. This suck. I can't. I never knew his real you name. Know what? I think I know who you're he, talking about. He was there. Yeah. During y'all's yeah. push. Yes. Matter of fact, that's how he got his reputation. Was, was yeah. hanging around with y'all. Yeah. And so I had to go meet him. And he had a big old chew in his mouth. He's like, I'll come get you. No- yeah, wherever you're at, I'll come get you. And I was like, yeah. hey, what's up, man? <laughs> and he would? He would. He, he would. didn't give a shit. Let me tell you something. Because you, 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 as we progress through the, the country, you got to call. <laughs> you got to call people to say, is it okay if I go in here and get into a fight? And, and they'll have to give you the green light. That dude didn't care. He just like, I'll, I'll, I'll make up for it later. He's like, if you need me, I, call me. And I'll be there. And he yeah. freaking was, man. There's fun inner surface rivalry, but y'all are oh, crap aside. Like when For you come sure. over that mic, you can yeah. hear it like, "Hey, who is this? Who cares? Come get me." Yeah, yeah, yeah well. right. Awesome. And you want to talk about a good feeling, and you don't appreciate it. Matter of fact, when I talk about it, I really feel it, man. It's like knowing that's a power. Like when you had that black box, you pick that sucker up, and that voice. There's gonna be a body behind it. Not only a body, there's gonna be some weight. Mm-hmm. It was that's a power you can't believe, man. But that that ODA that that's a good story, yeah. About yeah, no, because we blend we we were accepted by the army, which was in our service branch, right? And they actually got got sent home packing. Oh you know, gosh. they went home and you know, by Ron Clark, by Ron Clark, and Ron Clark every time he would see us, he goes, "What's up, Frogman?" Oh yeah. my gosh! You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And we were we're like known the army army frogman or something. The, the, the army seals. The army seals. They oh, start to so which <laughs> which we 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 found yeah. as a point of honor. But you know, for every you know that that SFODA for every bad one, there's a great one. Just sure. like every sure. every like there's a good seal platoon, there's a bad seal platoon. Um, God, SF is a great community, and they were Absolutely. Godfathers. Oh, there's no bad ones. Yeah. They're just good at certain things. Yeah, and yes. they, they're, that's not what they're supposed to be good at. You can't pull that away from me. <laughs> you know that with our guys. We got some are so damn crazy. We don't even let them out in the, in the open. Just don't only in war. Otherwise, put them in a bar, give them as much as they can drink, so they don't go anywhere. <laughs> Too damn dangerous. Freaking love them guys, but they exist for sure. Yeah. So I, I I was there. Um, it was the last mission that we were supposed to run before. SEAL Team 5 in your task unit came in, and then we would do some turnover ops with you guys and, and and go home. So we made some decisions. We deviated from what had worked uh, with you know good intent, because the Army had asked us to support something called uh, you know uh, Operation Kentucky Jumper, which was a, a clearance of the uh, uh, Al uh, Marib. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I'm blanking now. A, I can't remember that. A name, sector right? yeah, uh, was, of the city that was was bad. We'd been yeah. in there before. It was like <laughs> it was Papa Nine on the map. That's yes. what I remember. Freaking P sector, man. <laughs> so, I remember that place. So we were going to support it, but we also had uh, we we had to make sure that the the platoon was ready to go home. So a few guys were sent back to Shark Base to palletize and things like that. And um, again, we were young and we made some some errors and, and overestimated our capability because. We basically went from six guys on each rooftop uh, to mutually supporting sniper overwatch positions. 
which we were going to take to four SEALs. And of course, we had an army contingent that we call the Iraqi scouts. And so when you do that, now you're asking your guys to hold uh, longer security without less, uh, with less sleep for anywhere from, I think that one was supposed to be 48 to 72 hours. I, I can't quite recall. And so I was the OIC of one rooftop and you had Seth Tone, who was the platoon commander uh, of another rooftop. And so it was Mikey, uh, Benny Olson, and Doug Wallace, and myself, plus uh, six to eight Iraqi scouts. And we went in at night because the, the, the clearance operation that the first of the 506 was gonna do was, was gonna be a dawn operation. And so we went in, typically, you know, midnight to, to 1 a.m., occupied a very prominent building that we had identified previously, you know, previous to going in. We also knew the area, the most prominent building, third story rooftop. Uh, secured the family, the Iraqi scouts, kept a few on the first floor to keep the family at bay um, and watch over and make sure they were taken care of. And the rest of us set up on the rooftop. Uh, we blew uh, loophole charges so the snipers could, basically you, you blow a, a charge in a wall so you've got this hole where you've got cover all around you and you can fire through it and your scope can see through it. Mm -hmm. And so we set up a few positions, 360 security, other element was in their position. We've got good comms and then you waited for the morning to, to the sun to come up, it did. And uh, that's when just sort of engagements started to happen. Uh, I shot a guy, Doug shot a guy. Uh, there was a, multiple other engagements um, and they started to figure out where we're at. The longer you sit in a position, and of course, I didn't really understand this as a young Lieutenant JG, uh, you lose something called relative superiority and the momentum shifts because you're static. Mm -hmm. And so they were starting to blockade the street um, to, to keep you know signals like, hey, there's Americans that direction. The clearance operation ends uh, probably around midday. And of course, we're gonna wait for the army to leave and we'll wait till again, night falls use night to our advantage and then withdraw. Um, there was one position where Mikey was located that had become unsafe because he was hit by an RPG. So we had him come to my position. Um, and uh, guys were starting to get sleep on a, on a certain rotation. In about midday, um, Doug, who was the most senior enlisted, uh, it's his turn to, to get a little sleep. He's a sniper. And Mikey gets on his uh, his gun, uh, and you know Mikey's right here. Doug's to his left. I'm three feet to his right, and uh, Mikey's face this direction, looking through the loophole. Doug's facing that direction, and I'm actually seated the opposite uh, direction. And conversations are going on. Mikey's excited to get home because he was a family man. Again, uh, Mikey went to every Catholic uh, mass, if you can call it, in a bombed out building. Uh, devoutly Catholic, uh, his family is a man of faith. So happy, I mean, you, this family is like nothing you've ever seen before. They are close. Yeah, they're really, really good people. And so he's excited to get home. He's also going to sniper school, so he's ecstatic about that. He's excited. They're sitting after he got back? Yeah. That's cool. And because he's tired of carrying the machine gun. It's heavy. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but he's a big dude. And uh, he's also dating this girl that we're talking about. I remember this conversation. And the, you know, this girl worked at a bar and she had a kid. And I'm like, you know, give him, give him hell. I'm like, oh, dude, you can't do that. You don't want to be a father or somebody else. It, it, Big it, deal. Yeah, I got that. I, and I've, I'm, I'm a father at this point. To, uh... <laughs> I, 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 that's a big deal for us. We talk about it is, man. I, you know, just but then you deal. fall in love and, yeah. and things change. And I have a two year old girl uh, at this uh, this point. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm starting to doze off to the, the head bob. And again, I'm trying to go along, you know, I'm trying to be the tough guy, uh, overestimating my, my capabilities. And uh, I mean, it was hot. It's like 110 degree uh, heat index. And uh, all of a sudden I see Mikey just sort of out of the corner of my eye and I sort of wake up and he had shoved the chair back um, and stood up. And I realized something had hit him on the chest and uh, and fallen onto the ground. So during one of the lulls in the firefights, somebody had stuck close enough to the building or was on the rooftop on the other side of the street and just lobbed a grenade and it- What kind of was it? I'm sorry? It was a potato masher? It, it, so I never got full eyes on what it was, but it was I, I knew it was a grenade. 
and I sort of pucker at it that. It came moment. up over the deal, right? Or did it come down from the seat? From so you don't it know? came regardless. Of, like whoever threw it must have had the armor of Nolan Ryan. Well, they had those grenade teams mm-hmm. in the peace sector because we got our asses handed to them or by them as well. Yes, and we Th- they were they're real good. We remember reading those reports. Yeah, yeah. But the fact is, it hit him in the chest and fell in front of him. And I come to and I recognize what it is. And here's what's interesting. You know, we always have some scenarios and buds where the instructor will throw like a, a can in the, the sand and be like, grenade. And it just, it, for some people, it doesn't register. And one guy will go jump on it. And, you know, eventually you catch on. If the instructor's going to do that, you're going to jump on it. But it's very different when you know yeah. it is a real grenade that lies in front of you. Right. And he did not hesitate and he yelled grenade and he was looking at my position because Doug was was in and out of sleep. Um, and it was Doug's turn for sleep. I want to make sure that's very clear. Doug was, Doug is a unique character. He, you know, Doug is a good seal tactically and technically uh, and he could be abrasive, but it was what, what was needed. And I always appreciated that about Doug and he would call me out if I was wrong. And uh, he did not hesitate and he went right down on it and again i think i just braced for what was coming next and what came next was just brutal so when it went off he absorbed the majority of the blast flat floor flat flat floor flat dirt, roof wood no uh top, uh dirt but like a cement dirt floor like that hard pack over hard there hard pack it, yeah cement you're on the ground floor or you on the second no we're up on the roof you're on the roof we're on the roof and he jumps on it and it goes off. And at that moment, so again, uh, Doug, Mikey, myself, uh, Benny Olson is on a sniper rifle, probably six feet away. The Iraqi scouts run off the roof, except for one who was in the fetal position. When it went off, it sort of rotated me. And this was my first experience getting wounded and uh, not what I expected. All I felt was pain like just burning pain in my legs. I didn't even know if I had legs at the time. And uh, so you're sort of gritting down on my teeth. And so I rotate my head back to look at Mikey, whose eyes are so open, look in my direction. And I I said Mikey three times, each one just losing uh, a little bit of faith as it went. And uh, Doug leaps into action and he's in pain because we both have just shrapnel in our legs and Doug actually took one in the arm and it broke his arm. And so we're all messed up. uh, And Doug's like, we got to get him away from the rooftop. Benny's now. Is he still alive? uh, Did the blast kill him instantly? So they said he lasted uh, 30 minutes, but he was totally, uh, what's the medical term? Uh, Incapacitated. Yeah, Jack. Um, Not responsive. Take him on the chest, right? Take it right in the belly. Yeah, Yeah. that's what I thought. So uh, Benny pulls him away from the. the wall and Doug crawls over to him. Um, and at this point I'm like, what do I do? So my radio had been shut off from the blast, the embitter. I don't know if that, that is a, and I still to this day, I, it must be a foolproof system just to do a shutdown to, 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 to safeguard it. So I go to the radio and I, I tried to call to Seth in that element and the radio doesn't work. And so I know that the one Iraqi scout who was the senior guy has a Motorola that they carried. Mm-hmm. And so at this point, um, I also wanted to see if I had legs. So I, I get the breath. I look down. I've got legs, but they're a bloody mess. Uh, so I get up to run to the Iraqi scout. And as I get up, my legs won't work. And I, I do sort of a like fall right on my face. Um, and so I continue crawling over, grab the radio. Uh, by this time, Benny has Mikey's machine gun. And if you've ever seen Benny, this guy, like he was well-respected at SEAL Team 3 because he hit like pretty much every combat deployment from the start of the global war on terror to, to like to the major days. The guy like stayed around team three way too long. Um, and he's the sweetest man you'll ever see. And he's shorter. And I've never seen his face like that as he's not letting up on the trigger of the machine gun. He's just laying it down. So I run, grab the Motorola and call to the Iraqis on the other rooftop with Seth, Seth. And they eventually put Seth on the radio and I say, Hey, we're hit. Mikey's bad, man. We're taking contact. We need you here at our position now. And he says, wait. Now, I don't know how long it took for them to get there, but it seemed like like ages. 
And um, I call back to Mikey and Doug and I are just talking to Mikey and just telling him, hold on, man, hold on, man. We're trying to to, to cover uh, the wound. Was there a medic up there? No. So the medic had rotated back to the United States uh, two weeks prior because he had an opportunity. And because morphine at the time, we were still using morphine, not fentanyl. Well, fentanyl still is a serialized item. We, again, like these small mistakes. So he's responsible for the morphine. He's signed for it legally to get in trouble. So he had to collect up the morphine. We didn't think twice about it. We're like, oh yeah, here, here you go, man. So I do remember going for my morphine and there was no moss. There was, there was no morphine. An episode does not go by where we don't take a second to thank our sponsors over at Navy Federal Credit Union because they have been supporting our show for over two years, making sure we put out incredible content every single week, allow us to interview people who've had amazing, incredible, never quit stories and moments of adversity that they've overcome. And that is super special. That is why I've got to always shout out Navy Federal Credit Union. And the one thing I really love about them is that although Veterans Day comes every single year, companies rarely think veterans in a way that's meaningful, but that's not the case with Navy Federal Credit Union. Navy Federal Credit Union every day is Veterans Day. They think veterans in a way that's meaningful. They offer resources like the VA Loans Hub and the Best Cities After Service. They offer veteran employment assistance partnerships with nonprofits like The Mission Continues. It's one thing to make a social media post once a year to thank your veterans. It's another thing to put your money where your mouth is and actually show how much they mean to you every day. They're a top VA home lender. They offer personal finance counseling. They offer 24-7 members. Finally, the Iraqis started coming back up and with their AK started to engage in the direction that Benny was giving them uh, guidance. And finally Seth and the guys got there. Um, two guys sort of take me, you know, one under each arm and they don't know the way out. And we knew there was a back alley where there was a striker waiting. And so they're sort of dragging me with my feet off the ground. And I'm saying, okay, take a left, take a, take a right. Um, and they throw uh, Doug myself in the back of a, a striker and then the guy who had a fireman carry Mikey uh, into into the striker as well. And um, I remember the guy was so worn out because carrying Mikey was not small. This guy that was carrying him, physical freak. He said it was the hardest thing he's ever done because- It's uh, hard carrying that dead weight. Mm-hmm. Even when we train, you're still kind of like, hey, you know, but somebody's me, putting, you know, their, but you're always putting your hand in the guy's back. That's what I'm talking about. Like, even when you're There's trying to be mean to yeah. him, you can't. It's different when you when the when the dead weight gets on there. Yeah. And so he is like exhausted. And I do remember, and he he came to me and thanked me later. I'm like, God, I handled it in a bad way. I sort of like hit him in the chest. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Do chest compressions. Uh, he just needed that moment, and that's what you know. You yeah, said yeah, it. That's yeah. what brothers need. Uh, and he starts doing chest compressions again. I don't know how long the ride was. Um, but Doug and I are in pain because we 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 just there's no morphine. We're looking at like Mikey uh, in front of us, which is I'll get to that later. I do remember this. You know, at this point, we knew we knew Mikey was just gone, and we didn't want to really face the realities of what had happened. I do remember when we got to Camp Corregidor, the entire first of the five hundred six to include uh, Ron Clark and uh, and uh, Dave Womack, who was the XO. It was like the whole battalion was there. And so they get us on stretchers, they take us to the uh, infirmary, they give us morphine. Uh, we keep asking how Mikey is, then they get us back outside because CH-47s are uh, coming in to get Mikey, Doug and I to alticate him to go through uh, surgery because uh, they don't have a surgical capability. And I even remember Dave Womack took his uh, glasses off and put them on me and I flew off with his Oakley's and I, I still to this day tell me uh, I owe him a pair but uh, the surgeons at um, out of, uh, at TQ thought we would want some a moment with Mikey before we were, Doug and I were, were rushed into surgery and at the time I don't think I appreciated it it was more like you're rubbing a dog's uh, face in his own shit like the reality of, of what had just uh, happened. And uh, I do value that, that we got that moment. And then the rest is Doug and I are off to, to Germany after that for, for some follow-on surgeries. And then we get back to the United States and we make it in time for the funeral. 
and Doug, Benny and I, we're a little trio and you know they wanted us to speak at the funeral, but this is where it really set in for Mikey and just who he is. If you meet his father and you meet his, meet his mother, who Sally just passed away about two months ago, um, you know, I think you prepare and you you must have prepared for what you were going to say to the families. And, you know, I, I keep going back and forth of what do you say? And so they put us in the wheelchairs and I just get out of the car and they wheel us past the car and here's this, this woman. And then you realize, oh, this is Mikey's mom. Prepare to say to what you're going to say before I can get a word out. She wraps her arms around Doug and I and says, I'm, I'm so glad you're home and that you're with your families. And we didn't say a thing. You, you couldn't follow that up. So it was at that moment, like, I, now I truly understand. It, it closes a circle of why this man was the way he was. It was his family. It was his mom, it was his dad. And just the damnedest thing I've ever, ever, been, ever seen or, uh, or been a part of. No, I really appreciate that. Yeah. I, I, honestly, Mike, I didn't even hear that from... I think this is the first time I'm actually hearing it from you. Um, but, I, you know, I, I want to stay on top of... You know, I don't want to digress into yeah. other yeah. things Mikey. here. But, yeah. yeah. But to your point, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, that's just how Mike was. You know, every time he had an opportunity, he's, he wanted to be in front. You know, what, so... What is that? It's with the families. It's when we meet them. Yeah. Because you have a boy... Well, first of all, what you guys are looking at right now is not what, what you would see if we were out doing our deal. That's completely different. Mm -hmm. Completely different animal. And that's what we roll up with. So when we meet the parents for the first time, we're like, that's your mother? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It's like, how yeah. you spawned from something that great? Like they were that, 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 those wonderful people. And you know they have that great side too. Otherwise, they would. we forget that. Like, it must be a good dude. Otherwise, he wouldn't take this pain with us. I mean, we suffer together. You're never gonna find another crew like that. And then when you when you, we actually go home with each other and you see the parents, you're like, wow, he has parents too, you know, or it's it's something. We still stay in touch with um, the families of Red Wing, so it's yeah, well, it's our family. We, we know, you know we, how that feels. That's why it made made me so emotional just thinking like I know that that had to be just gut wrenching when you saw because you don't you're scared that they're going to be mad at you you know for not doing something or whatever the your head is telling you yeah. but it, that's that's not true and that's not what god would want and it shows that they're you know a true family of faith because all they're caring about in that moment is is you and your safety and yeah. that and how proud they are that you came to see them and you were the last person with their son like that means that's got to mean so oh, much to them. That totally you came to see them, so completely. Yeah, I mean, he, my, think of the way he died. I was talking about this the other day on stage. Mm -hmm. You're talking about us sitting around and something just rolled in the room and it kill you quick, and it was a competition who could jump on that sucker. He did, I mean, he did it for. Y'all, I mean, and yeah. that's how he would want to die. That's how you would want to die. Like that's that's all of y'all. That's what y'all train for. It's got to be a cool that. place in heaven for the guys that do that particular thing. Yes, you know what I'm talking about. There, I know that there is. There's this own little thing that those particular guys get to jumping on those, like the VIP section. Yeah, sitting you next know, to Frank something Sinatra really cool that. that will be like, oh, great, sure you do. You got that one. So he was the type of guy that would make jokes and be silly. Oh, he's too. a funny guy. He's funny, guys. You'd make jokes of everything. <laughs> you got you to see some of the videos that are out there. Well, it's not out there. Yeah, but some, it's... some. The platoon <laughs> videos are great. The way they used yeah. to do those with yeah. The, yeah. the opening scenes from the TV shows. Yeah. 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 Priceless. Yeah. So, with the book, what did. So, George, did he give like the full story or did y'all have input on that? How did that work? Yeah, I mean, he gave uh, his end of the story of who his son was. So my understanding is that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, and one of the things is that when Rose approached me is that, you know, is people were forgetting who Mike was basically, right? And the, the thing is like, oh, your son to George, right? And maybe Sally is like, oh, your son, the guy who jumped on the grenade. And my understanding is that he, that's not what, is that, that's not what Mike was just all about, right? right? Jumping on a grenade. He was more than that. 
So my understanding is they wanted his story to be told to show that he was more than just a Navy SEAL. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a son. He was an uncle. You know, he was many other things besides that. That was an aspect of his life. Sure, um, can't take that away. Um, but definitely, I mean, that's everything. It's something that even Ron Clark said is, you know, they, while the SEAL teams may have trained Mike, you know, his character, his moral fabric of who he was, was, was given to him by his, his family. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So we can't take that away from him. So we need to know where he came to. from. Yeah. No, I'm just, yeah, yeah. It, who is trying yeah. to? But when you see, I, I was like, wait, yeah, wait, wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. But when you see, when you stop telling your oh, stories, yeah, we won't ever. Yeah. Right. We got guys right, right. rolling around with meat tags. I've right. seen some full on portraits. <laughs> Absolutely. And all of yeah. our Michaels. You should see Cowie. Is Cowie it, has is a good one. Pretty cool tattoo. Is a good one, right? Oh, yeah. Well, and that's why I think it's, I mean, we both think that that's it's so important wing. for, yeah. you know, Mark even 48. this platform, <laughs> yeah. everybody else's platform, whoever has it to share these stories and encourage people to go out there and buy the book or if there's a movie or a documentary or whatever it is learn about these heroes and not just the the act of valor that that took their life but who they were that made them do that act of valor i like to say not only learn who they were but learn from them right mm -hmm. i mean the book and in i don't know about you but you know i'm like i don't know you know rose sent the pre-pub versions i'm like I, my wife's like i can't wait to read this together i'm like I, I don't think i want to read it um but reading about his childhood you know one of the common things i i, I saw was you know he hated bullies mm. he hated bullies and there's a story that makes me laugh because all the guys i knew uh are, are strong dominant guys that, that joined the seal teams but some of them were were not i mean some of them are just you, you wouldn't guess they were seals but they all collectively had this hate for bullies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when, when you when you meet people who don't list necessarily like the military because they have a bad understanding, but they're broken down, they're in their car broken down in a major storm at 3 a.m., probably scared shitless because you, you never know who's going to pull up behind you. And then all of a sudden it's one of these guys who would get wet go into the cold to help you change the tire and get you back on the road. Mm -hmm. I mean, these, these, it's, it's like in the blood is that you defend those who can't defend themselves. You stand for what's right. And if necessary, <laughs> give your life. Well, I've never heard it explained that. That's good. What is that? Because that's perfect. It's like, Hey man, we'll go over here and cause as much mischief as we possibly yeah. can. But if something goes down and the tire goes down, Oh, we've got to fix this tire. Yeah. yeah. We're going to help And then you. we'll go back to the yeah. mischief. It's the craziest thing. It goes back to that warrior in the garden you mentioned. That's you know right, man. That's yeah. why they put so much stuff in front yeah. of us. But and, how many times? Do all that. How many did, times did you see the guys raid a house? And unfortunately, in the houses, sometimes there were there were children. <laughs> yeah. And when the raid is complete, you know, target secure and back clearance, uh, you know, uh, complete, you'd see one of the guys scoop the kid up, take a chem light out, and so this guy who just was just aggressive all of a sudden dials the empathy up to grab a kid who's crying and, and just console him mm -hmm. or there's her. definitely a switch you know yeah yeah, oh, yeah we there's have, definitely we a switch you got, yeah because there's many of those times that you see these you know a bunch of kids a bunch of women you're like okay right, this is they're not the threat no you know what i'm saying i mean still That's you gotta savage. Right? Not, we're not savages <laughs> we're, we're well yeah, we're not well savages. trained yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. and those, when the dad comes out and i've seen it too Break down a house, tear it apart, and the next thing you know, one of them is rocking the kid. Somebody's in the kitchen cooking breakfast, and we're trying to repair <laughs> something because all the men have been killed in the house, none of the women left. Mm -hmm. One of those recons we would do all the time. That would happen mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. Guys out there fixing stuff while we're waiting on the op just while just to help them. Yeah. That's where we learn our the cultural part of our job. We couldn't learn in buds or anything, man. When they sent us to that war and just threw us in that neighborhood. Yeah, I mean, you just if we didn't speak the language, man, you felt the vibe. And then yeah. everyone's trying to kill us. Every day, all day, night and day. Sleeping in your body armor and all that crap. Remember that? Mm -hmm. So well, I am so glad that y'all are promoting the book and that his dad agreed to or wanted to do the book because a lot of families just want to close that chapter and move on and not talk about it. But it is so important, like you said, for us to learn from their stories, learn who they were. I mean, we named our child after one of them. And I, I, we've been able to meet so many people just 
out in the world. I mean, over the last 12 years since we've been together, we've traveled so much for different events or whatever. And we meet so many people who are like, oh, I named my son Murphy or whatever it is. And for them, for that kid to grow up knowing who they're named after, even though they have nothing to do with the military, but that story impacted them so much. And so now, you know, there will be more Michaels or there will be, you know, whatever it is. We need that. Our country needs that. We need that pride in the, you know, who we are and who we're built on. Every so, team guy story resonates. I, you can't you can't bring a team yeah. guy here and say, "Hey man, tell me your story starting mm-hmm. from when yeah. you had birth." You'll be like, "Yeah, it is a story." Yeah. Tell yeah. me when we have if, yeah. if they if we did have one, we got rid of them, mm-hmm. or they or something. You know, they just weren't around. And if then you, you have the life yeah. that they stuck us in, not where we come from, what they put us in, and watch us go through that. You want to talk about some stories coming out of that, Melody? There, so. I've got a company yeah. called Talent War Group. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the guys, one of the partners is a Marine infantry officer, Joe mm-hmm. McNamara. Never knew Murph. Mm-hmm. Named his son uh, after Murph. How awesome. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's almost like you, you name your, your son after, you know, first testament. Name. Right. Yeah. Biblical uh, name or. Mikey. I named my son after Mikey. Mm-hmm. So you would think, well, it's Michael. You know, his mom made a joke. Well, that'll be very easy because you have the same name. So I made sure that his middle name was Michael Anthony. Mm-hmm. Sorelli. Um, so did uh, Doug. And a few others uh, named their, their kids after uh, after Mikey, and I know so many after uh, the guys from Red Wings. But, uh, you know, all the answers to all the problems that we have going on right now and the, the, the divisiveness, you just got to go back and read the stories of these men. There, there's a there's an Instagram account. I hate to bring that up, Instagram, but it's called Operation Hawkeye. And they post all the the day that people passed away. Yeah. And you just take five minutes a day just to go look up two of their stories and read about the remarkable men and women that they were. Do you know when that started? No. I can tell you. That started from J.T. Tummelson that died in extortion. And he was from Iowa. The Hawkeyes, right? Hawkeyes. And now that, that makes sense. That <sighs> account started um Right when extortion happened and there was a ton of us in Iowa, there was a huge just concentration of people like watching, trying to figure out who the men were of extortion. There wasn't a whole lot of information coming out because some of the families were just super private. But at that time, JT, um, it was John Tomlinson, but we call him JT. Mm -hmm. Um, He was single. His nickname was like, Money love or true something. Love. True, love true love, because he had Losing like me one. a love. million you know how, girlfriends. You know, yeah, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> he had so many girlfriends, super handsome, and a, my mother still has a picture of him framed her, no by, by, by in her, her couch, room, by her, by her bed. <laughs> Not me or my brother. That freaking dude. That's how good looking he was. <laughs> He was a good looking dude. He was a good looking dude. Handsome guy. Yeah, but yeah. um, but because. I think he didn't have that, you know, super private family. It was, there was just a lot coming out on him. And somebody started that Operation Hawkeye from that. And as soon as there was more information about extortion, the extortion guys coming out, they would post that. And then it just gradually went on to whoever, whoever else was coming. Second, but I, second worst day of my life. Seriously, yeah. That was because that was my unit. Oh my so gosh. we took such a heavy hit on that. I was in DC when the phone calls started coming yeah. in. So JT and Morgan were, were roommates. roommates at the time, yeah. and um, very, very, very close. Um, that one screwed. My, that one hit my brother pretty hard. That was a very, very hard hit. So Which, I mean, everyone. There's a lot of guys, obviously. Thirty-three, yeah. thirty-two of us. Uh, no. Thirty-one. 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 Yeah, there's a dog. Thirty-two, like I said. <laughs> he's, he's in that count. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it was. Uh, I, I was with that troop, the deployment oh. before. Um, yeah, that's that's another story. That's just a a wealth. That's like losing thirty one Mikeys. Mm-hmm. That's the equivalent or oh, yours. Man, you, yeah. yeah, when we get hit like that, that's yeah. I mean, ones and twos. Same one as, thing. Yeah. Yeah. And we thought we thought yours was the worst day. Of our NSW was going to well, have. Y'all, y'all yeah, y'all looked that up. Yeah, it was. If until... this competition, y'all won out. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I was just saying when them phone calls would come in, it was like one, seven, nine. I mean, that was random. All, mm-hmm. I was in a hotel. Mm-hmm. Not to get down that rabbit hole, but just the numbers. When you get into teens and the 20s, and they're like, ah, 27, 29. You're like, 
It was crazy. What? what? Yeah. So, yeah, Operation Hawkeye Instagram is great. And there's a bunch of them out there that will give you actual information about the fallen and enough to where you can at least get, you know, you can connect somehow. Oh, this guy grew up in the same area that I grew up or whatever it is. And then learn about them and share that story. There's also some guys from San Diego. I don't know if they're still doing it or not, but they, some team guys that created these challenge coins with the Fallen on them. Do you know about this? No. And they would, their whole thing was, it had like a little um, barcode number on it. And the concept was to give it away and then the person would type in that barcode and it would pull up the website and a whole information thing about them. And it was just to like keep passing it on so people would learn about it. It was a great concept. I don't think, it, you know, I don't know you look at, uh, you look at that Operation Hawkeye account and, and you just, the guys, you're women you didn't know and you're like, damn, he was a, look at this guy. He's a handsome man. Look at that smile. Yeah. The amount of life that was in that, that guy. Oh yeah. And it's gone, wiped out. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm a firm believer of, you look at Mikey's story and, I know we're proud to be that is it's amazing that Memorial Day is one day. Mm-hmm. We don't get a full month. Yeah. To, oh, to, yeah, that's like 4th of July. Like, why, why take American flags down mm-hmm. after 4th of July? Yeah. Why aren't they up <laughs> all the time? To tell the stories for 30 days straight, almost like a, a, a period of mourning. Mm-hmm. And, and they're not meant to depress anyone. Mm-hmm. Like they're meant to, to show that you need to live your life in a, a, a different inspire. way. Inspire, yeah. You know what I, I think about is and it's probably not healthy to think about this, and, and I don't want you know the family to, but he would have been one hell of a father, man, and he would have had a fire team. I know well, he would have had a fire team. Yeah, man, yeah, well, you know the best, so the best we got, the brightest yeah. we got, the smartest ones, the most special ones we have always die in war. They're the first ones to go. But they're still here. I am. I don't want to yeah. sound like a crazy yeah. person, but I am a true believer that yes, our flesh dies, but our spirits still stay alive, and they are lived through like his spirit is lived through y'all and like Marcus will always until he dies the stories of his brothers will always be known because they live within him and he shares those stories so it's the same with y'all it's the same and it's the more people y'all tell then it lives with them so I am a true believer that it's only flesh that dies our spirits will stay alive, especially if you've got someone living it. And that's what y'all are doing by sharing about this book is you're living his spirit. I hope this book goes, goes viral. Yeah. Me too. And give it to, give it to your teenagers, yeah. give it to your kids. Yeah. How can they find it? Yeah, How what do we need to do? How can people find it? Track Our it listeners. Down. So the release date is November 8th. That's so correct. Right. That's Amazon. Right. November. Yep, November 8th. Um, and the right. name of the book? Uh, defend us in battle. Is that right? So St. Michael. And, yeah, and Michael. we didn't mention the day he died. Yeah, I, I mentioned yeah, it earlier. No, yeah. Yeah. I mentioned yeah. it earlier. Not on air though, but on... Um, St. Michael's Day. Yeah, it's on, you yeah. know, okay, for air for air purposes, right? Yeah. He was, he was a Catholic. So uh, September 29th is the Feast of St. Michael, Michael, right? Mm-hmm. So it's interesting. I don't know if there's no such thing as coincidences. Do I keep saying that? Do I have to keep putting that out? <laughs> Yeah, so it's, yeah. I, I found that pretty fascinating. I was like, this wow. last Thanks. September um, feast of Saint Michael, I think I said the Saint Michael prayer like fifty times. <laughs> it's one of those things as a Catholic, like when it's a feast day, you just like constantly repeat prayer, and it just it just helps you. And I'm a true believer in that too. I don't care who what anybody has to say, but um, the Saint Michael prayer is the best prayer that you can say for your own protection from physical and spiritual, mental attacks, whatever it is, it's, you know, and that's another way to think of him, you know, just by saying that prayer. So. Hence why you got to see Cowie's tattoo. Yeah. Okay, well, y'all need to yeah. send a picture. Yeah. <laughs> it's talk, it's basically, it that's what it is. You is know? it? Yeah. Thank y'all for coming yeah. on. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Tell the family we said hello to yeah. people in our yeah. prayers, and we'll, you know, that's how it works. Yeah, as long as we start George talking about him, man, ever... he won't ever die. Team guys yeah. keep him alive forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That just, oh yeah. Our fraternity doesn't. You don't die in our fraternity. It passes. It yeah, passes it down. Yeah, it's passing along. Yeah. Something, something to keep you going.